Hi everyone, we need to talk about assignment two. So, um, I'm just going to move my head so you can see me, we can see the page better. Alright, so this is assessment two as you will find it in our subject outline. So the idea of assessment two is that you choose a selection, sorry, a collection policy from one of the one, two, three, four, five that we have available for you to look at and you evaluate that policy against a whole set of questions that we've put together for you and you write it as an essay in three parts so we'll go through it together um, just so you get a little bit more information about it so you know where to start okay so it's due the 23rd of april so what's today the second so you've got three weeks or so to get this done it's worth 50% of your final mark, so it is the, the biggest of the three assessments that you've got to work with for this subject. And we want it to be around 2,000 words, and you can go plus or minus 10% on either side of that. And you just submit it through EASTS within the Interact site, so it's just a straightforward written essay, this one. Okay, so here are the five uh, collection policies that you can have a look at. You, can, you only need to work with one, so have a look at each of them or whichever one appeals and choose one and then that's the one that you'll be writing about for your assessment. Uh, some of these are really good collection policies and some of them are not so good. So it depends on what you want to look at and whether you want to focus on something that could be improved a lot or focus on something that actually has, has it covered pretty well. So completely up to you. So as I said, three main parts. So we've got an introduction to the policy, then we've got a discussion about the selection and acquisition processes that are described in the selection in the collection policy, and then a really short conclusion. So they're the, they're the three main things that you need to do. And we've given you a word count here. So introduction to the policy is 500. The majority of the writing will happen in this section here, where you're looking at access and acquisition and selection and deselection uh, principles and practices and then just a hundred words at the end as a conclusion. This is a really easy bit, introduction to the collection policy for 500 words. Um, so you just we're looking for you to see if you can work out who the potential users of the collection might be and what information needs they might have. And then we'd like you to have a look at how well the policy covers things like digital resources. So how well does it describe what resources are in the collection? Um, how well does it describe uh, what they've got in terms of the different formats, so the different electronic formats, websites, ebooks, online journals, all that sort of stuff. And how well does it, when we say covers it, we mean uh, how well it is it, does it describe how those particular formats should be managed within the collection in terms of their, um, you know, their purchasing and their um, where we look after them once we've got them on the shelves or on the shelves on the digital shelves um, so just a bit of an evaluation there of how well the policy describes what those formats should be how those formats should be treated within the collection finally got there and then this one here how clear is the policy to someone who knows nothing of libraries and archives so when you're writing about that bit think about how much are they using um, acronyms and professional language and that sort of thing so how much is it is this policy written for the internal use so for staff to use it to guide them in their decisions about the collection and how much of it is written to be accessible for people who are users to the collection or stakeholders to be able to understand because yeah it's quite a different uh, different audiences will have different ways of being written for so have a think about that as you're looking at your policy and how well does it describe how selection decisions are made? So, you know, some policies are fantastic. They say, you know, these are our three preferred suppliers and you must go to them for electronic formats. You must go to these people for printed formats. Uh, they're really detailed. And other policies just say, oh, we like to buy a bit of stuff about Australia. And it's really, really vague. So have a think about how well your uh, collection policy explains how selection decisions are made. So that's sort of the easy bit. That's really just looking at your policy, pulling those things out of it and writing it up. So 500 words uh, just to do that. So that's, we'll work at, that will work as the introduction to your assessment.
to your writing. Now, this is the big chunk, selection and acquisition discussion. So we've got 1,400 words here and two major parts. So if I was doing this, I'd aim for 700 words each for each section. And within here, we've got a whole heap of questions for each of those two things. Now, you can do this in whatever way you want. You can either use these each individual question as a heading and then write a paragraph under each of them. Or you can um, group it into sort of more thematic things, if you like. Um, so this one, so like for example, if you're looking at uh, this one here, selection and deselection principles, you could do uh, a whole section on weeding or you could do a selection on um, a selection. You could do a section on donations or you can just you know, write question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. So whatever works best for you, have a think about how you'd like to approach this and you might start writing it with you know, question by question and then think oh it would actually flow better if I took the questions out and just had a broad heading, you know, weeding or broad heading donations or something like that. Um, so no hard and fast rules about how to present this, just keep an eye on the word count and um, make sure it sort of reads as a nice flowing essay, but headings are fine, you don't, don't be nervous about using headings. Um, so these questions are all pretty straightforward. Um, I think you won't have any trouble answering those. If you do, just let me know and we'll, we'll talk about them some more. Um, this one got a question the other day from a student. So I'll just talk about that one. Are there any non-standard restrictions on interlibrary loan access? So you know how some, if, you, if, you're, if one of your users wants something to read that your collection doesn't have, your collection or your library can contact other libraries who do have that thing and say, hey, one of our users would really love to read this book. We don't have it. You guys do. Can we please have it on an interlibrary loan? And usually the other library goes, yep, no problem. And they'll post it off to, to the requester's library and it will be then given to that user to use for, for a loan period. And then when they finish with it, they return it to their library. Their library packages it back up and sends it off to its home library and it's returned. So that's an interlibrary loan. Now, not all collections will support interlibrary loans, and that's something that you can try and hunt for in your policy when you're looking for it. Some libraries won't do it because they might have unique items and only, so might be, everything's so precious, there's no way they're going to put it in the post and let someone else use it. Um, it could be that they're fragile, it could be that they're like really, really valuable. Um, and therefore they're not available for interlibrary loan. It could be something like the formats are um, not good for interlibrary loans, so things like um, you know, microfilm or something like that, often they won't get loaned out because they're so fragile. And also things like if you've got um, electronic access to a book and a user from another library says, oh, I really love to read that book, and but there's, you know, the library who do have it isn't my library, maybe I'll get an interlibrary loan for it. So they go to their library and they say, hey, can we get a copy, can we get access to this electronic book that you've got for one of our patrons? And often the library who has the item as the electronic book will say, no, we actually we can't do that because our license agreement stops us doing that. Our license agreement to access this electronic book is only available for our own users. And that's really common these days. So interlibrary loans can be more problematic for electronic materials than they are for print materials, particularly when we're talking about books, not so much journals. Individual journal articles in e-journals tend to be um, able to be shared, but e-book access tends not to be able to be shared across for interlibrary loans. So see if you can find anything about that in these policies. And that's what this uh, statement here is here. So a non-standard restriction on interlibrary loan access, that could just be because, you know, it just means when won't they lend stuff on interlibrary loan. So see if you can spot that in the policy. And when you're going through these questions, if you're finding, actually I can't find anything about donations or I can't find anything about weeding, I can't find anything about interlibrary loans, well then that's a valid point too. So just make a note of that, say, you know, there is no information in this policy about interlibrary loans or there is no information to potential donors about what materials will be accepted. So 
find the faults in these things as well as finding the things that you're looking for. When you don't find something that you think is important for it to be there, then give that as a part of your discussion about what's missing from these policies as well as what's in there. Um, I think the other thing I needed to talk about was oh, a couple of things. <coughs> Pardon me. The rationale um, is the um, the reason we're making you making you, the reason you have to do this assessment. And one question that came up was this statement here: to be able to exhibit ethical decision making and reasoning to identify solutions to issues such as access, censorship, budgeting, outsourcing, and cooperative resource provision. So one uh, student asked me, what does that mean? And that's a really good question. So what it means is that when you are discussing things like donations and weeding, and any other thing that turns up in your policy that you're writing about, if you can demonstrate to us that you have thought about aspect of collections in an ethical way then that will score your points so things for example might be if you have got what are our libraries we've got um, okay so Eastern Regional Libraries collection development policy so that's a public library network so if you are talking down here about um, reading is there a deselection policy how regularly is it taking place? What's done with material rem removed from the collection? So, for example, you might think, okay, this is my little weeding discussion. How can I bring ethics into this? So you might think, what are the ethics of weeding materials from this collection? And then you might say, well, is it ethical to weed stuff out of a collection that's been paid for by public money? And then is it ethical to just chuck it out? Or is it ethical to put it on a trolley up the front and say, hey guys, you can buy this now, we don't want it anymore. You can buy it for $2, even though you already paid for it in your rates and your taxes. Is that ethical? So that's where you get to weave that sort of ethical thinking into your discussion. And um, there might be other things too, like access. Is it ethical to restrict access to things that are paid for by public money? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the situation. Um, censorship, if you are working with a policy that's talking about, um, I don't know, what have we got here, gay and lesbian archives, if you perhaps have, um, if there's a, if something in their policy that says we do not collect materials that relate to um, gender reassignment surgery, then you might say, well, is that actually censorship if they're not contributing to the collection in this sense with that particular topic is are they censoring that topic or is that just a defined focus and that's okay so that's where you can just sort of thread in that discussion about ethics and uh, reasoning to add to that discussion and if you manage to do that which is sort of like the hardest thing to do in a way because it's not just describing what you can see in the policy it's taking it a step further and showing your thinking around those issues and you would get good points in this section here where we're looking at ethical decision making and reasoning so uh, these little boxes here will describe to you what we expect to see at each level and if you can work that sort of argument into your discussion really well then you'll score highly on that particular bit there um what else do i need to tell you i think that might be all um, this is if when you start writing or well, before you start writing you should have a read of this rubric <coughs> Pardon me. and you can see how we're allocating marks so 10% or 10 marks to um, the identifying the stakeholders needs 10 marks to looking at emerging trends and issues relevant to your collection so what that means to get points there what you'd need to do is to draw on the broader literature that's out there. So look at journal articles or reports or other things like that that are scholarly, so not just people's opinion, but actual research based writing or writing based on people's experiences working with collections like these. And see if you can 
get any ideas from them about how collections like this could be handled. So if you were doing, for example, the, um, I don't know, the, gay, the Lesbian and Gay Archives collection, then you could do some searches in the literature, so in journal articles, that to find anything that's been written about similar archives and how they're managed. Or maybe you could do a really broad search and look for how to, um, you know, journal articles that relate to archives in general and how their collections should be and can be managed. You might also be able to go out and find a collection policy from a similar archive that's really, really good and then say, you know, and in comparison to this archive, my archive's doing a really bad job, there's a whole lot of stuff in this really, you know, best practice example that could be in the Lesbian and Gay Archives. So use your um, broader journal literature to give you um, some depth to your discussion. So instead of just saying, I reckon they should have a donations policy, that instead of just saying that, you can say, okay, well, in this journal article by Smith and Jones, they stress the importance of having a donations policy to avoid X, Y, and Z. And that way I can see that you've threaded the existing journal literature into your discussion, which obviously adds weight to what you're saying. So it's not just your opinion, it's the understanding of knowledge that we have from journals and other resources that can add to your discussion. I hope that is clear. Um, so there are 10 marks for each of those, one, two, three, four, 40 points and then 10 marks for writing nicely and referencing nicely and um, using APA referencing style. So have a read of what you need to do at it for each of those. Um, I think I've said this to you before, but if I haven't, I'll say it again. When I'm reading, when I'm working to a rubric, what I would do is read the high distinction thing and think, okay, that's really what I'm aiming for. Then I would read the pass thing and think, okay, I must make sure I at least get that done and then anything better than that is just a bonus um, but you know this is obviously what you'd be aiming for but this is also good enough so as long as you've got to the pass level then you'll pass the assessment and all will be well if you want to really go for it then this is where you should be looking to see exactly what we're looking for at the high distinction level and I think that's it so um, I hope this helps if you have any questions, of course, just, just let me know and I'll go through it with you. And um, good luck and have fun, I hope. I hope it's an interesting exercise for you um, as well as one that will, you, know, you have to do anyway. Thank you. See ya.